from the local, national and sector. To be blunt, we have to go where we can actually make a difference at the moment. Um, clearly, with a, a new government, if there is a new government, that might potentially open up some uh, avenues that we don't have now, we'll see. But nevertheless, if there's a good local campaign, then we should be involved in it. I think what would be useful, uh, certainly um, I didn't realise that campaign, uh, I'll have a chat with Sam to see if we can get our members in Cumbria to link up uh, and what have you. And that's what I think was really good about these things is that we can link up much better than we, we can now. And whilst obviously we do have these big ideas, uh, clearly that's not in opposition <coughs> to, if you like, ex uh, trying to link up with the existing campaigns now. Hopefully we'll reach a critical mass where we can actually start to talk in a serious way about a climate change service, which for me, as I've met very badly, uh, have set out, it actually stands for something much wider than just a very dry reorganisation of the UK civil service. Um, I think it's a synonym for a wider discussion about society, to be blunt, about how we organise the economy. I think that's in a, a conversation that is actually happening all the time in the climate change movement. It's not dominant everywhere. Some people obviously have uh, just think that I don't. And I don't decry that, and I certainly don't mean it in a sarcastic manner, that greater recycling is the way to go and that that's what we have to do or people have to change, have to have different lifestyle choices and that if they didn't fly so often then that would make life better. Um, I don't decry that sort of discussion, but I think that advised the fundamental discussions that we need and I'm really glad that we're having that in this conversation and other places um, and I do hope maybe this is for loan hope and I, I look to say that in the trade the TUC we might have that sort of fundamental debate because we haven't had it up to now we've actually sort of like uh, circled around a more fundamental debate but I'm hoping that the pressure literally of climate change will force every union and horribly what's happening and I'll definitely finish on this in Port Talbot and one time has brought home that there is ways there is going to be a transformation of the economy or, or change in the economy. The only argument is on that what control and what, what mechanisms. Paul Talbot probably would have happened under just transformation, but clearly it could have been done and should have been done in an infinitely better way than it's been done now. So these changes are coming. The only argument is how the change is going to happen, under what control, under what steam. So I think the trade union movement is going to be forced to have those conversations, whether it like it or not. But it'd be much better if we had those conversations voluntarily rather than under the sort of pressure of events. Thank you, please. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to do two key points because John made some of them, so I won't repeat what he said on voting or sex based. Just on the point that was raised last the end on climate assemblies, because they can't run everybody, they don't actually. It's interesting there's climate assembly here in Chapter. I said, we want to be part of it, we're stakeholders, and the council said, no, we want it and you're not. <coughs> so actually, the findings of how we organise matters, you know, uh, in, in, these, in these things. And bringing us together as trade unionists and campaigners actually is so important because we often don't get the voice in some of those kind of civil bodies. Um, so I think that's worth remembering. The point that was raised about... Um, how do we work in unions actually is fundamentally important to me because it's a trade union conference and that is kind of, you know, my line, um, I suppose. But that's really important actually because it matters about how you tackle the issues over pay, over conditions, over what the role of the union is. And I think, therefore, the role of being political in trade unions and bringing in issues like the climate emergency is absolutely fundamental <coughs> to how we try and get change on it. And I think that has to happen at every level. It's a branch level, you know, in your in sort of region in, in the national structures of, of the union. That's why, you know, I mean, I'm always trying to think of political things that we raise to talk about in our branch that are, and the, then highlight why they're relevant to trade unions, obviously Palestine, but actually over the climate emergency, you know, we did start, inspired absolutely by young people, we start thinking what we could do. So the reason, part, part of the reason why you know, we can host this meeting here is because we argued with the council about climate activism uh, over it, that you may not be aware of it, because there's all tea and coffee put on. That's free, because we've made the council provide free tea, coffee and milk for everybody who works for the council. 
there used to be this still a handful left but there used to be thousands of plastic cups everywhere we made them buy crockery for people to eat their meals off and things like that um uh, you know so there's the small things but we also argued they had to do things on a bigger scale so when they had the school students walk out back in september 2019 we got the main council building is in a big square we said we're going to hold a rally in the square we're going to do it whether or not you want us to um, but we are, you know, we are going to do it. We met with the council leader. We ended up having, and um, we got the council to ring the alarm um, at, at 12 o'clock. You know, it's an emergency. You ring an alarm for an emergency, don't you? And 400 people came out of work, came to the rally, and quite a number of us didn't go back to work. <laughs> we joined the school students on the protest. Nobody got disciplined. Nothing happened to anybody. And part of that was we'd been organising for some months about, around what we did in the workplace around the climate emergency. Absolutely, the pandemic's had an impact, and I think we'll have to rebuild some of that still. But I think that's the kind of thing that we need to look at doing in our local branches. It makes people, it educates people, actually. It makes them feel much more confident about what they're doing. And it makes people be, feel part of that broader movement that is about a different kind of, of, of society. And therefore, I think that's why it's really important that we get as many units as possible to try and sign up for that thing of the year of climate activism. That doesn't mean we don't do anything between now and you know, 2026. Or whatever, but actually, we end up with a coordinated year where all the trade unions are saying to all of their members, This is what the climate emergency means, and this is what we're going to do about it. This is our ideas at the top of the union structures. It's also kind of unleashes, you know, room at the bottom and the branches for people to think about what they can do and to take that forward. Thank you. Bless. Many environmental NGOs and even the social movements like XR, Just Stop Oil, act as if a main problem or obstacle to the necessary change is public opinion. I think this is <coughs> fundamentally misguided. More and more people recognize the need for decarbonization and even fundamental change in the economy, but few of them see any practical means for collective action to bring improvements. That's the problem. And unfortunately, the action groups and even mainstream environmental NGOs have little to say about this. So what is the role of effective collective action? How can people get involved beyond simply protesting? As Twine is an entry point, but it becomes the end point. It just becomes a perpetual circle, reinforcing people's sense of impotence. Well, all over the country, there are local campaigns of various kinds relevant to decarbonization and a just transition, even if they don't use those terms. And they often arise to oppose what they don't want, like the Cumbria coal mine, like a new airport, I think in Sheffield and a few other places. And that turns more people to think about positive alternatives. What kind of economy, development, whatever it's called, do we want? in our metropolitan area. And that leads to greater support for ch fundamentally changing, for example, transport systems, housing systems, energy systems. So there's great potential for engaging people around these potentially tangible improvements. But then there's another obstacle, in, in addition to people not necessarily feeling positive or optimistic about collective action, and that is local authorities. Of course, all these campaigns try to engage the local authorities, but three decades of neoliberal agendas by both major parties have hollowed out local authorities, reduced them to contracting out services, weaken the budgets, expertise, and certainly the vision that a, a different future might be possible. So, so that's why the local campaigns need to mobilize their own counter-expertise and both help and push the local authority to bring in the extra capacity in some form, in some kind of co-production, you might call it, to co-produce a different future, with, starting with the few local officials who, who want to create a better future. Thanks, let's have, sorry, that's okay. we've got into the yeah. lunch hour now, so it's not even long enough, okay. and we've got some people speaking in sessions this afternoon, so yeah. we need to have a bit of a break. Um, Sarah.
I'll be really quick. I think we have to have a national plan. But in order to get there, you've got to have local action. You've got, you know, the, the marches, using the, the marches for Palestine as an example, the turnout has been phenomenal in London. But there's still so many people in our local communities that don't really know why people are getting together in London. You know, not everybody thinks like we do. So I think you've got to have your building blocks there to achieve something big. And local actions, talking to other people, really get into that education piece around why climate change change impacts them. I think it's fundamentally key. The sectoral stuff, I think there is a room for that and there's a place for that to keep it relevant to those those their interests and, and make them feel like they've got an expert opinion into their something that they do. But I think the local building up to our national is key. And on the point of universities, um, Bill Cutler at Leeds University is doing some fantastic work, you know, and um, I'm sure it's called Limits, isn't it, that they're doing? That's that 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 okay. so. But Joe Cutler up in um, Leeds Business University, rather than Leeds Beckett, um, is doing some fantastic work with their team. So definitely, if you want to kind of link up and you've not already contacted Les, then reach out to Joe because I'm sure she'll be able to do stuff. And then on the road travel, when you said about 30% to reach net zero, I was actually thinking about my own road travel, because you know, I have to be there and everywhere. Um, and I can't, I've started catching more trains, mm-hmm. partly because when they turn up, and I don't mean the strike action, but when the trains turn up, um, it, I get to do more work whilst I'm sat there, you know, from a purely selfish point of view. Um, I can sit and do work, it's better for the environment than my, my, my car. Um, and I, I wonder if that's a way around getting people to realise how much more comfortable it is sat on the train, um, even from Leeds to Manchester, um, than it is stressing about traffic and cars and the roads that are becoming more dangerous. How many accidents do we see every day? Um, and the answer is only a year and a half and all that. So I think that kind of narrative around being safe is like really important to Brilliant. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, again, on the transport. Some countries and cities have had the, you know, taken creative ways to actually encourage people to drive the train and drive the bus. So Luxembourg has made public transport free, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, that could happen or something similar could happen. It has happened to some degree with the two pound bus fares. You know, it does encourage people to give it a go. Um, and I know that um, a friend was in Madrid and they, you know, they've got a kind of scheme where you, you, know, you pay 10 pounds and you can travel travel for the whole month anywhere in the in the region and you know then if you if you even get your money back you've actually used it you've actually done it. So um, you know, these things could happen. It just takes a bit of creative and, and a bit of testing and things like this. Um, and just to add on this sort of organising in your unit, if anyone else is a Unite member, we do have a um, grassroots climate justice caucus which is nice it's on a WhatsApp it's got a series of WhatsApp groups. If anybody is interested in that, come and have a chat with me and I'll give you the link for that. That's very good. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thanks, everybody. Just quickly before everyone runs away.